begin with a demonstration of what exactly I'm going to show you. Uh, basically, I'm a physics teacher and I'm here uh, to share something about an uh, amazing tool uh, that has potential to transform the way we teach and the way we learn. Okay, here I'm just using a small interface. It's something like this. Okay, small box called x -Files. And let's do a very simple experiment. What I'm using now is a small motor. And on that DC motor, a small magnet is mounted, a neodymium magnet. And I have uh, these small pickup coils. Maybe a little later I'll show you these things. And using this device, I can actually drive this motor. Okay, so now the magnet which is mounted on the motor is rotating. Then I'll just bring this pickup coil close to the magnet. I'll be able to see that there is some disturbance in that graph. Okay, actually it is it is fetching the data of voltage generated in that coil. So let us let us add this time scale so that we'll have a clear idea about what kind of voltage we are getting there. Okay. So it's it's actually a sine wave. So we have generated an AC signal here. We could fetch the data using this kit and we could plot the data using a very simple Python code in real time. Maybe I'll use one more coil and for this now I need one more channel. So I'll bring this A2 and select second channel. I'll bring the second coil close to this magnet. You can see one more curve there. right? And here, we can play around these things. We can just try and explore and we can learn so many things. Now as you can see here on the screen, both the waveforms are in phase. When I was a student, for me it was quite difficult to understand what is phase and all those things. Okay, we used to just mug up, reproduce in the exam. We never really understood what it is. If I just rotate one coil like this, now you can see that the waveforms are out of phase. And just place them at 90 degrees. Maybe let us reduce this time scale a little bit so that it will be clear. Okay, now you can see the waves are, they differ in phase by 90 degrees. Right here, there is a 180 phase difference. If I rotate one coil like this, they are the most in phase. Then if I just put something ferromagnetic, even a screwdriver in this coil, the amplitude of the signal will increase. So basically, it's a very simple tool that students can use to perform so many experiments at home. Basically, it's a pocket science lab where we can do almost all physics and electronics experiments with low-cost devices. In fact, so many devices can be made at home. OK, let me start with the presentation now. So what you have just seen is this computer, uh, sorry, uh, pocket science lab. XPIES is experiments for young engineers and scientists. But this was the idea behind the project. When we started, unfortunately, almost everywhere this is the situation. In our science education system, too much importance is given to the theory, and experimental part is always neglected. Now, where do you think this kind of vehicle will go? Right? And there are many reasons for, for this kind of ignorance in, in educational system. Maybe exam-oriented evaluation system, lack of interest, or maybe it can be lack of equipment. And if the last reason is the true reason, like lack of equipment, then x is an answer. It works with a 5-volt source, or it can actually work with USB port of a computer. Right? Basically, it's a low-cost device. So low cost device that can generate and, and measure voltage. Uh, there is a built in signal generator. We have a ready made oscilloscope. In fact, it's a digital storage oscilloscope. And uh, the most important feature of this interface is the microsecond time resolution. You can measure any two events which are, which are separated by four microseconds. And that gives us the power to fetch the data. And uh, do some real experiments. 
okay, the hardware is inexpensive, and I can maybe I can claim that it's the cheapest pocket science lab in the world. It's fast, flexible, design is open. You can use it with ready-made GUIs available, or you can access that source code. You can just modify that code, and you can use it for your own experiments. Okay, so what is this XPIs for? For students, for learning by self-exploration and experimenting, for teachers as a tool for demonstrating, in fact, as a tool that can that can bring your lab to the school, and for engineers and for hobbyists or hackers as a hackers as a testing device. Let's talk about the features which are available here. In fact, if I say it's a full-fledged physics electronics lab, uh, there are there are uh, many digital input outputs. We have 12-bit analog resolution. There is an inbuilt waveform generator. You can have a steady sine wave of 100 hertz. Uh, there are two square wave generators where you can you can change the frequency of the square waves. You can have two square waves generated with some phase correlationship between them, and all can be done with a few maybe two or three lines of Python code. Uh, we have GUIs available for more than 50 experiments. For teachers like us who do not know ABC or programming, they can use those readily available GUIs. They are self-explanatory. Uh, this is Python programmable. It can work as a test equipment, and it's very small, maybe of the size of your small credit card. And the design is totally open, free. In fact, it's royalty free. And we have freedom to use it at at different levels. Like level one, you can directly use UI programming programs which are available if you do not know programming. If you know a little bit of Python programming, you can actually access uh, this tool, write few lines of Python code, and fetch the data. Say for example, I actually used one terminal called A1 terminal here, that is analog input, and with just <coughs> one line of Python code, I could fetch the data and plot a graph. Okay, and level three is you can uh, study a little bit of microcontroller programming, and you can do, you can create standalone systems. Okay, you can just see that program there. Like we are importing that XPIs library. And just one line, p comma v, that p dot capture, that is the function defined for capturing data. It can it can uh, record the data say 200 times and uh, with a difference of 100 microseconds. Uh, that can be measured with uh, a gap of four microseconds also. Okay, and basically the project started in 2005 by Inter University Accelerator Center, New Delhi. These are nuclear science people. Uh, in the beginning, we had that huge kind of box there, and then in 2006, we shifted to microcontroller, and Python made it easy for all of us. Because for uh, teachers and students who do not have any computer science background, it's very difficult to go with C and do this kind of stuff. Python has ready-made libraries, just import those libraries, and you need to know just mathematical functions which you study in classrooms. Okay, so 2011, that was the next version, XPIs. It had a 10-bit resolution. And now we have a smaller a box, but with better resolution, that is 12-bit resolution. And it's much cheaper. <coughs> okay, so this is how we can communicate with XPI's box with just three lines of Python. Like import the library, and you can read inputs. You can write inputs, write outputs. You can, you can set those frequencies. You can set the voltage. And you can connect different sensors to this device. Like uh, for my experiments, I use temperature sensors. I use pressure sensors. I use a small DC motor as a pickup coil. In fact, you can do so many mechanics experiments with that. You can do experiments with coupled pendula, right? You can take two pendulums and to take that signal, you can use DC motors. And these are very low cost devices. You can use uh, SRF05 ultrasonic uh, uh, position sensors, right? That sensor can send a pulse of ultrasonic wave. It gets reflected from the obstacle and you can actually measure the distance to few millimeter. So, Many low-cost sensors can be connected. Okay, and actually, I use this code to fetch that data in the beginning from a pickup coil. Right? You can, you can, in fact, uh, fetch data from four different inputs simultaneously and plot it on the screen in real time. Okay, so here this is one example to set square waves as this function like uh, oscillator and a function generator. So if you need to generate square waves, it's really simple. You can use that set squares. Uh, definition created for XPIs and you can actually set square waves. Here, 
that graph shows two square waves generated with a 90 degree phase shift. That is almost 25 percent. Okay, this is the ready-made GUI that we use to access the expired scale. It's a four-channel storage oscilloscope, and as you see, almost all features that you have in a very costly digital storage oscilloscope. And here the cost is not even one percent, maybe less than that. Okay, and what kind of experiments we all can do with this? Okay, you can study logic gates, uh, you can study interface of sound, maybe I'll demonstrate this a little later. It's a very interesting experiment, transistor characteristics, acceleration due to gravity, and there are many more. And in fact, you can access the same code, just make few changes, and you can, you can do your own experiments with this. Okay, last year I had an opportunity to work uh, for this GSOC project under POS Asia and we could develop uh, code for accessing new sensors uh, like the SRF05 ultrasonic sensor. Uh, there are some uh, instruments available for doing mechanics experiments like verifying Newton's laws if you are aware of, right? momentum, collisions, all those things. And those devices are really very costly. Some American uh, uh, proprietary uh, devices are available and those are in a couple of thousand dollars, right? But here, with this kind of code and uh, some homemade uh, solution for this apparatus, you can actually bring down that cost to just one or two percent. Okay, so the project status, maybe I should skip this. Right, there are some people who are helping us out. Uh, we have our volunteers in France. Uh, Mr. Jarvis is responsible for one project in Europe called uh, Pocket Science Lab and they have adopted this kit as the basic component of their project. It's going to happen since uh, from April this year. In fact, this is our goal. If you compare the cost, okay, here it is US dollar 30, maybe a little less than that, and that equipment uh, multimeter, I think it's one liter, multimeter, right? It will cost you $1.5. In fact, both these devices have same kind of hardware, but our device is a little costly because we are not able to manufacture that in bulk. But if somebody takes that kind of opportunity or a responsibility, you can say, and manufactures this in bulk, we can bring down this cost to 1.5 or 2 dollars. So you can imagine every student having a very affordable science lab in his own pocket. So when he, when he goes home, he can do all sorts of subs and learn by exploring. Okay, so availability, you can just go online and you can order if you want. Basically, I should clarify that I'm not here to sell this equipment. This project is open source, entire design is open, so if anybody is interested in manufacturing it locally and distributing or spreading the awareness about it is welcome. Okay, so it comes with this kind of kit and basic uh, devices that you need. Pickup coils, you need buzzers for doing so many experiments, resistors, transistors and capacitors. And these are the links where you can have the complete information. Maybe if I have five minutes more, let us do one more small experiment. Now for doing experiments with sound, what are the things we need in a normal laboratory? If you think of place from where I belong, okay, we have we virtually do not have labs in high schools. Students get access to labs only when they go to 11th standard, and that too two hours a week. So they just get two hours a week in physics lab. So it is almost impossible to do these things. Right? So in that kind of situation, this, is, this, is, this can offer a great help. Now if I want to do some sound experiments, say interference of sound, we need two different sources of sound. We need frequency generators, function generators, that is again a costly device. Then we need one acoustic sensor or a good quality mic. Then we need a digital storage oscilloscope which can plot the data for us. So we need a full-fledged lab. But here we can do all those things with very simple devices which are available. Okay, so for this actually I am using two small buzzers. The circuit is actually removed so it works on AC. And then there is one inbuilt mic here, a small mic. So I will generate sound with these buzzers. Okay, and I will fetch the data using a mic. And output of the mic is connected to a channel of this CRO. This is small part. Okay, 
this type. So what we need is two sources for generating sound. And a mic. Okay, this is the main screen. And we can access these readily available experiments using this tab. Let us search where is the interference of sound machines here. So you have this main GUI for the experiment. And again, for those who are not familiar with all this kind of stuff, for them there is a ready-made circuit schematic available. So I'm just basically using two piezos. One is connected to square wave one, the other is connected to square wave two, and the other terminals are grounded and the circuit is complete. So now I'll just test whether these buzzers are working. Okay, this is this is the first buzzer. Right? And if I bring it close to the mic, you can see that waveform there. Okay, it's actually a square wave, but since we have fed it to the buzzer and it's oscillating like this, you get a sine wave in there. Let us test the other one also. And here the frequency is about 3600. Right? They are slightly different in frequencies. Now what we should expect here? When two sound waves are traveling simultaneously in a medium, okay, they will go in phase and when they are in phase, amplitude increases and when they go out of phase, okay, they destroy each other, right? So we should have that periodic change in the intensity, right? That is one very interesting experiment. Let us try that. I will just sound both the buzzers together and we will be able to see that waveform there. You can, you can get the flickering sound now. It's not uniform like before, right? And you can actually plot the data on the screen. And this can happen very easily in real time. And what we need is just maybe maximum five lines of Python code. Okay, one line to write that output for deciding the frequency, another line to decide frequency of second source, and just one code to fetch that data using an input terminal. So it's really very easy for a beginner to get started with. You don't need any official training for this purpose. Anybody can start working on the device and anybody can man modify it for their own needs. Maybe I should stop here if anybody has any question. So have you tested from students like what's the feedback from students? Yeah, what I did is uh, uh, in my place, there is a different story again. Uh, our students they study in their vernacular medium like Marathi or Kannada language till 10th and when they come to 11th standard everything is in English. So first problem that they face is the language problem and second thing is they do not have these kind of facilities right laboratory. So what I did when they entered my campus on the first day itself I just gave them these boxes. I selected 12 students and I gave them these boxes and I just demonstrated these ideas. I didn't use scientific terms like interference, electromagnetic induction and all those things. I just gave them, demonstrated these things. So if you bring a coil too close to the magnet, oh, this is what happens. Okay, so I just allowed them to explore those things. And after a week, when they came back, I just start ask, uh, started asking them questions. What happens when you bring the coil close to the magnet? And they said that that amplitude increases. Okay, what happens if you increase the speed of the magnet, rotating magnet? Their answer was ready. What happens if you insert that ferromagnetic core there? Their answer was ready. So I did not have to teach them. In fact, they could learn most of the things on their own. And then what I had to do was, I had to just tell them, okay, this is what is called electromagnetic induction. Then I asked them, okay, the relation between the speed and the coil, the number of turns, right? Okay, so I, I, need, I had to just help them with the technical terms, like statement of Faraday's laws, first law and second law. Their answers were ready in their own language. Okay, uh, I, my job was just to introduce uh, with them, them with English words and that made it all easy. In fact, one of my students is now working in a startup, he's in engineering. He's doing so many wonderful experiments with this. He just removed those uh, plates from his buzzer, piezo buzzer, and he used that buzzer that, I don't know which crystal he used, I think quartz or something, I don't know, uh, piezo crystal. And he used it as a sensor and there is some kind of game he was talking about. On the browser, just above that Google window, you get one dragon-like thing and something comes in the front and that jumps, right? So he used one photo detector and this kit 
and he simply placed it in front of the screen. So whenever that, that dragon comes or some obstacle comes, okay, light intensity will change and directly a key can be driven. Okay, arrow key can be driven from that and it starts jumping. And in one day he could create a new world record for that game. So that was an amazing experience. If there is no other question, I think uh, I should thank you for your question. Yeah, thank you. yeah, we still have a few minutes. Uh, can you tell a few words about uh, the uh, so the XPyce you say is a, is a Python based uh, water? A little bit. Can you tell me a little bit about dependencies? I saw you do a PyLab. Uh, yeah, okay, what are the yeah. external dependencies? Uh, we use uh, uh, Matplotlib. Okay, we use uh, PyLab, and for plotting this, we use uh, PyGrace. Grace for plotting. Yeah. But it's, uh, it's, uh, you can download, install as a single package, yeah, it installs. Yeah. You, uh, can, you can install. The bin packages are available online and it is officially in Ubuntu repository. The latest version is there. We are working on RPM. Any more questions? Yeah. Yeah. It, it works with Fedora also. That is what I was talking about. We are working on RPM. Uh, directly also you can install it in Fedora. It works on almost all uh, Linux devices.